All right, I think we're ready to get rolling. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Janice, for pulling that down. Great. There we can see some lovely, friendly faces. It's terrific to see you all. Uh, so on behalf of the National Coalition, National Coalition for Community Capital, or NC3, it is my pleasure to welcome you here today. We really appreciate you being here. We're excited about this work uh, and excited to share it with you. So just a little bit about NC3. We've been around for about 100 years. Well, maybe not quite 100 years. Uh, we've been around since officially since uh, 2017, but really kind of got together in 2015, 2016. Uh, and um, what I love about NC3 is there's tremendous expertise uh, here at NC3. Janice was one of our uh, co-founders um, and just had a remarkable resume when she came to us, uh, when we came together. Um, but at the heart of all of the work that we've done is community. And even though we had expertise in different fields and different geographies, what we really cared profoundly about was our communities and the well-being of those, and in particular, the financial well-being of those communities. And so it's been a real pleasure to work together with a group of uh, visionaries uh, who get things done. And I think that's been one of the exciting pieces of, of this. And I think it's one of the things that's really exciting about today. So we have a really lovely, uh, lovely crafted um, mission statement. But I, what, what I want to do is, of course, throw that out with the bathwater, baby out with the bathwater and say, that we are very interested in and about building individual wealth and individual community wealth. Uh, and through uh, the uh, mechanisms of investment and ownership. And that really says, sums up, I think, well, what NC3 is all about. And so to that end, um, it's really exciting today uh, to turn it over to Janice Shade, again, one of our founders and, uh, and a dear friend of the community capital movement. Um, to talk about the work that she's been uh, doing under the umbrella to some extent um, of the National Coalition for Community Capital and then through her own work, uh, really pioneering work in the community investment fund world. So uh, having said that, welcome. Um, we're anxious for you to hear from um, both Janice and Yanni uh, and I'm gonna sit back and watch along with the rest of you right now. So thank you very much. Welcome Janice. Thanks, Chris. And it's great to see so much interest here um, in community investment funds. Um, and so let's just start off first with what is a community investment fund? And from the perspective of NC3 and a lot of us that are working in this space, um, the, the most basic definition of a community investment fund is one where investment is drawn from members of a community into a fund collected there and then invested back out into businesses and organizations within a community to circulate, um, circulate wealth within that community as, as businesses and organizations are, are successful, um, that, that then gets paid back into the fund, it goes back out into the investment investors and that circulation of community wealth goes on. Um, but like I said, that's the most basic definition of a community investment fund. Um, we are now working towards creating uh, ways to take community to the next level, so to speak, and look at ways to create funds where not just, um, not just uh, people who are considered accredited investors are allowed to invest in funds, which is the case with many um, investment funds that exist today. Um, you know, many of you have probably heard of CDFIs or community development finance institutions. The vast majority of those only allow investment into them from institutions or people who meet the definition of accredited investor. There are some exceptions, um, two of which I'm very proud of up here in my neck of the woods, the New Hampshire Community Loan Fund and the Vermont Community Loan Fund that allow investment into the fund from anyone regardless of their wealth status. This is something that we at NC3 are very, very um, vocal about. It's part of who we are and our mission is to allow democratic and, and broad access to anyone to invest into these funds. So that's that's something that we have been working towards. It's, um, it's not always easy, but there are ways to do it. And we'll talk about some of those today. Another aspect of community investment funds that, that makes them unique and what will help take them to the next level is the concept of community governance, where members from the community have a say in how the fund is deployed, 
and invested out into the community. This is where we see, unfortunately, fewer examples of how that's done, but it's something that is really gaining an interest. There are a lot of organizations, including NC3 and others out there um, in the world that are working to do, uh, create more examples and ways to incorporate corporate or community governance into their funds. And again, we'll talk a little bit more about that um, today. Um, and where this all came from is, uh, or where this particular webinar came from, uh, it grew out of a handbook that NC3 was commissioned to create uh, two years ago, I believe we started in 2019, um, supported by the Solidago Foundation um, to create uh, this Community Investment Fund Handbook, which is really a how-to guide for creating um, local wealth, equity, and justice. And so the, the, the handbook uh, was released. We wrote it in 2019. We uh, released it into the world in March of 2020, just as the world started to shut down. But it couldn't have been better timing in a way as we saw what has happened over the last 18 months, um, especially with locally owned businesses and the struggles that they have had to overcome to stay in business. The, the, interest in and momentum around community investment to support our local businesses has really grown, which is, is just one of the, the beautiful silver linings of the last 18 months. So to that end, <laughs> the, the handbook kind of came out at the right time. And um, just recently, um, NC3 um, engaged me to create some tools to go along with this handbook. Um, the handbook itself uh, has examples of 10 different community investment funds, a variety of them from around the country. So a variety of geographies, as well as a variety of ways uh, to set up a fund, whether it's going to be focused on, on real estate or um, supporting, um, supporting local farmers or any number of different ways according to whatever the, the community's needs are. So we have some case studies in there uh, of these different funds. And then the chapter that, that I was responsible for was how to set up a fund that goes through a lot of the steps that go into setting up a fund. And the tools that, um, that we're presenting today are meant as, um, as an add-on to that chapter to really help communities to, to dig in and figure out what are the, you know, what needs to be done to make sure that this is all done, first of all, legally, and is also operationally sound and hopefully in the long run, financially viable. So that's why we're here today. Um, we're gonna start, as I mentioned, um, in the handbook, we have a bunch of examples. One example that's not in the book, but that I'm really excited to share with you today is uh, WePower and the Elevate Elevar Fund. And um, we've invited Yoni Blomberg here today, who I, I worked with, gosh, Yoni, what was it? To end of 2019, I think we started. Um, we started working together to create a fund to support the work that the Elevate Elevar Accelerator is doing. And I'm not going to steal Yoni's th thunder, um, but let you, uh, first of all, start off telling us a little bit about WePower and the Accelerator. And I know you've got some slides to share, um, so I will let you take it away. Sounds great. Um, glad to, to be here with everyone today. Um, and yeah, excited to share a bit about our work. Thanks for, for inviting us, Janice. So um, we're based in St. Louis, uh, about three, three and a half years old at this point. Um, and just for everyone's background, uh, we exist as an organization to activate community power, to redesign systems to be just and equitable for all. Um, we do that with a focus on, for the foreseeable future, our education systems and economic systems. And we do that in partnership with and centering um, Black and Latinx communities in St. Louis, um, particularly poor and working class Black and Latinx communities. And so we carry out that mission um, through four main strategies. The foundation for all of our work is authentic relationship building um, and, and just talking with everyday people about barriers they're encountering, needs as well, and, and challenges, as well as visions, opportunities, hopes, dreams. Um, we, we build on top of that foundation through two primary like buckets of work or, or our second and third strategies, which involve activating a movement of um, people we call change makers, that's community organizers, systems designers, public leaders, 
Um, and then there's the, the work that I focus on um, and our team focuses on on the community wealth building side of things that's focused on accelerating community owned wealth generation. Um, and then lastly, um, we tell human centered stories to shift beliefs and behaviors because we, we think this work can have more impact when we amplify it and show people what's possible when we fully invest in black and brown communities. Um, and so the way we accelerate community owned wealth generation is, is a three part strategy within, within that area, we have a three part strategy. First, we accelerate uh, existing businesses through our accelerator, Elevate LVR. Um, we also invest um, in companies with significant growth potential through um, both a partnership with Kiva, 0% interest loans, and then the investment fund we're gonna share more about shortly. Um, and then lastly, we're working to build the capacity um, and kind of like bench of residents um, who are, are engaged in democratically controlling the wealth in their neighborhoods. Um, and so contextually, like we, um, we set out to do this work because we think like the generations of systemic racism that St. Louis and so many other places in this country, basically everywhere have experienced is obviously a grave injustice and has resulted in massive unmet need. That also means massive unmet opportunity. Um, we know there's immense potential um, when we fully invest in black and Latinx entrepreneurs. We also see a missing kind of middle in the landscape um, of capital options, uh, especially for black and Latinx entrepreneurs, which we'll talk more about. Um, and then lastly, we, need, we recognize that we need new models of economic development that foster shared prosperity. Um, St. Louis, like a lot of the sort of Midwest and Rust Belt experience, what happens when corporations leave and, and pursue cheaper labor or cheaper uh, lower tax rates or, or whatever elsewhere. Um, and, and we also recognize the climate crisis and everything else we're facing. And so we need new models um, that center um, the thriving of both people and place and are deeply connected to place. So um, more tangibly, so far we've worked with about 30 Black and Latinx owned businesses through our accelerator and our partnership with Kiva. And the companies from our accelerator and our first cohort last year went on to raise about $400,000 in a mix of grants, um, grants, loans, and equity investments. Um, approximately more than, more than actually tripled their revenue between last spring when we started working with them and the end of the year. Um, and then through our partnership with Kiva, companies have raised about $55,000. Those are pretty small loans. Um, and then we've raised um, a little over half of the one and a half million dollars we're seeking for our, our investment fund. Um, so yeah, I, I'll, um, I know we're, we're gonna hop to Q and A soon. So just quickly share a little bit about our accelerator. Um, we work with companies that are beyond the idea stage. Um, we, we target or focus on companies that are sort of like 50 to 250 or, or upwards from there in, in annual revenue. Um, that's two fifty fifty thousand. Um, and we're pretty industry agnostic and focused on more like values alignment and the possibility and, and real potential to create living wage jobs. Um, and so we have a founder's commitment to community that incorporates um, a commitment to paying living wages, environmental sustainability, um, hiring from the neighborhood and or locating physically there. Um, so the accelerator, I can talk more about um, if we wanna get into that. And then the partnership with Kiva, um, affords entrepreneurs the opportunity for 0% interest loans um, with no collateral, um, no, no minimum credit score, no hidden fees, um, up to $15,000. And so that really came out of the work of the accelerator, um, seeing that a lot of entrepreneurs are reticent to work with banks, seeing the legacy of um, what banks have done, particularly in, in black and brown communities and, and the history of discrimination there, as well as the inaccessibility a lot of times. And so people were saying, what can we do with crowdfunding? How can we um, do this differently? And so that's where that partnership came from. Um, and then most recently we've launched our own investment fund. Awesome. That is a great overview, Yoni. And again, it is it is remarkable to see how much you've achieved in the last few years. Cause I think, I, I think it was November, or October, or November of 2019. And you all were just kind of like had the pedal to the metal to try to get the accelerator started. And then on top of that, you wanted to start a fund to support them. And that's where we came together. So let's talk a little bit about that process that we went through um, uh, to, to get you to the point where you were um, ready to start a fund. Talk, talk, talk a little bit about the initial desire, like what drove the desire behind wanting to start a fund? 
Yeah, so we um, started this process with you in um, late 2019, but um, even going back to 2018, before we launched the accelerator, we, we started with a, a entrepreneur and community focused research and design process that involved a lot of community listening, interviews, focus groups, um, aimed at understanding what are the biggest barriers and challenges Black and Latinx entrepreneurs in St. Louis as well as nationally face. What is the prime, like that firsthand um, conversation and learning tell us? And then what does the desk research and, and like national literature show us? And um, barriers with access to capital kept surfacing as the number one challenge. And so the accelerator focuses on that. But we also knew kind of from that point that we wanted to, to get into opening up access to capital ourselves directly with a fund. Um, and so we, we started with the accelerator. And then as we did that, um, that gave us a great deal of learning about what kinds of capital were necessary, um, what, what types of terms would be effective. And then we also engaged in like a, a second round of research, talking to impact investors across the country, ranging from more traditional CDFIs to like uh, impact focused venture investors and kept finding this like really bifurcated landscape of like basically banks or CDFIs that are pretty bank like um, that are by design somewhat risk averse looking to invest with sort of fixed terms and say okay we'll, we'll invest this and you repay it on a fixed schedule and you should have a credit score of at least this and some collateral and and whatnot and on the other side you have venture capitalists who are like go big or go home. Like what's the path to hundred million dollars in revenue in under a decade? Like I'm looking for that. Um, and we realized like, that's not, that's like less than 1% of all businesses. Um, but, but this more traditional banking or CDFI approach like often has barriers. Um, and so we were like, what does it look like to rep? Like, like the real gap is the friends and family round as our, our friends at Runway say, um, like, solving the friends and family gap. So what does that look like? And, and um, with a focus on black and Latinx entrepreneurs. And so that's, um, I guess, the point at which we entered conversations with you trying to figure out what do alternate terms look like and started to pilot that, um, looked at what NDVC was doing with revenue-based investing and just kind of alternative approaches to investment and, and testing those terms with the entrepreneurs in our accelerator saying, would this be like, what are your reactions to this? Would this feel like, would, given these three options, venture, banks, and CDFI, or something more revenue-based, um, like, what do you like about each option? What what resonates with you? And from there, just kept honing the terms. And yeah. Yeah, that was that was a lot of our work. And that's, that's actually a great lead into my next question, um, that, you know, so much of what we worked on together was the financial modeling for these various types of um, investment terms and that kind of thing. Now, what made my job a lot easier and a lot more fun is that you have a deep level of experience with financial modeling and, and financial acumen. Um, as I'm gonna talk about later today in this webinar, we're gonna be talking a lot about um, how you set up a team to create a, a, a community investment fund. And um, I'd like to get your uh, perspective on how important it is knowing that a, a group can always hire somebody like me to come in and do the modeling for them. Um, but how important do you think it is to have someone on your team with that level of financial acumen to be able to work through the process? I, I think it's really important because that so much of the language investors speak. Um, and so I guess it depends on like where you're raising capital from and, and how you're thinking of like capitalizing your funds. But um, I, I, we think about this both when we're raising money and also like deploying it or investing it. Like you don't wanna be just about spreadsheets and numbers. Like that's gonna miss the human dimension and the character and the, the like, traits that like the actual trust and the the unique element of the humans in the mix um, and if they're the right people to achieve what they're they're setting out to achieve um but also if people just have an idea and like a cool vision but they can't show how the numbers all add up to to getting the money back and getting like the, the investments working out it's lacking in some credibility and so um at minimum i think you need someone on the team who can understand the the inputs to the model the variables, what drives profitability or loss, and 
um, be able to explain that. They don't have to build it from scratch, which is like where we brought you in. And it's like, I don't think I'm gonna, like, I don't know all the operating costs and all the different pieces of this, but the ability to understand it um, is critical to being able to manage it. If you don't know, we, we tell that to entrepreneurs as well. Like, if you don't know your unit economics and like what's driving your costs and your revenue, then you're not in a good position to manage your business like with financial savviness and the same goes for investment funds. Yeah, yeah, that's great, thanks. Um, yeah, and that kind of touches on another point, another, uh, for me, a great uh, learning experience in working with you was, um, and that led to one of the tools that, that is now in this toolkit is the operating structure and starting to think through, you know, at, at a certain point, once we had gotten through all the financial modeling, the next piece was to really think through, okay, what is it actually going to take to run this thing? Do you have the in-house expertise to be able to do it, manage it all um, internally? Or do you need to maybe bring in some outside resources? And so a lot of that work that you and I did together resulted in what is now the operating structure checklist. Um, and one thing that that kind of what through that process with you is that we realized that there might be some need for outsourcing some pieces of the operation. Can you tell us a little bit about how uh, um, the the connection with mission driven finance has worked out for you and and where that fits in the mix? Yeah, absolutely. Um, connections have been like with, without connections and relationships, like we wouldn't be where we are. Um, like. I, I reached out to Cutting Edge Capital um, to ask them about legal entities and like how we like how a nonprofit could set up their own investment fund and also to talk with them about some financial modeling. They introduced us to you. Um, we worked with you on some of the financial modeling. You introduced us to Mission Driven Finance, but then introduced us to Living Cities, who invested half a million dollars. So like you really see through that set of connections, like how relationships are all of this. Um, but more specifically to your question, like we we know that our strengths are our connections with entrepreneurs, our understanding of the St. Louis landscape, our, our impact and mission vision and like theory of change. Um, we know that no one on our team currently has a deep background in financial modeling um, and accounting and, and like managing the back end operations of the fund. We didn't have the budget or strategic desire to add those as full time roles, nor would it make sense for such a small pilot fund. Um, so the introduction to this group based out of San Diego that works nationally, Mission Driven Finance, um, for me was really critical because they've been able to help um, partner with us or like help us uh, as partners go through the final stages of the design process as well as the the like build process. Um, Lauren Gratton there describes it as like um, I think design build fly, like figure it out, build the plane, and then fly it. So you're not like totally building it at the same time you're flying it and. <laughs> Um, they've been able to help us with each piece of that. And um, we're shifting now to the part where they'll do the deeper financial underwriting of deals. So we'll source prospects, go through, see if they're a fit on the management side, the impact side, the preliminary finance side, like basically to the degree to which I can vet them financially. Then um, if they pass all of that and they look like a fit, we're able to lean on mission-driven finance to do a, a deeper, more traditional financial underwriting. Um, and then ultimately the investment decision is made by our investment committee, which is majority um, black and brown residents from St. Louis and, and black and Latinx entrepreneurs from St. Louis, um, but kind of comprised of, um, like that's the majority of the group. And we also have folks who wear more traditional investment hats. So you get a lot of valuable cross perspectives. And so that's where to your point in your opening remarks around community governance, like that's ultimately how the decision is made. But well, my role in mission driven finance's role is to bring the right information to that group. Say these are the risks, these are the advantages and like the areas where things are aligned. Like it's your choice. Like we recommend investing. We recommend not investing. Um, but ultimately it's that group that will make that decision. That makes this all makes me so happy, Yoni, to hear um, this. This is really a beautiful example of community governance um, kind of at its finest. Um, and in describing a way to use both internal resources, internal to the, to the organization, external resources, not even, it's not even in your community, it's outside, you know, in a whole different state, and then bringing it back together really to that granular level, um, the really um, deep community level with your investment committee. So um, thank you for sharing that. Um, you know, a couple other things um, that 
that I wanted to touch on were um, just the, the way that you are now educating your, um, yeah, your accelerator members on how to become good investees. And can you talk a little bit about the technical assistance that you provide to those in your accelerator um, to be able to receive uh, the kinds of investments that you're doing? And I'm asking this question for a particular reason. One thing that I hear a lot, I've actually heard it through the grapevine from Mission Driven Finance and others is that there is a lack of deal flow for lack of, you know, for lack of better term, but you know, really saying that, gosh, we wish there were more deals that we could invest in. And my theory is not that there aren't deals out there. I think there are plenty of investable deals out there. I think there are a lot of entrepreneurs who don't know how to make themselves investable. And I think you all are doing a great job of that with the accelerator. So if you could talk a little bit kind of specifically about that, how you're training your business owners um, to be able to go out and solicit community capital. Yeah, the accelerator was really designed around, I mean, we, I, for context, it wasn't in my slides, um, in this set of slides, but when we developed the accelerator, we used Village Capital's curriculum, which is a group that's been doing this for over a decade, domestically, internationally, and has a curriculum focused on investment readiness and centered around peer review by other entrepreneurs. And so from running that through that curriculum last year, um, and, and then again, this year, we've gained experience like supporting entrepreneurs um, and again, a shout out to you for, for coming in both years of the, a great session on like navigating the capital landscape or, or the capital map and figuring out your own capital strategy because every business needs to think about like what's the right source of capital and, and sequencing, et cetera, for them. Um, there's not at all a one size fits all solution. Our fund's not right for everyone. No, no investment is. Um, so we, we have experience like supporting people with that, but that's a good example of where it's not all just the spreadsheets. Like the thing that makes someone investment ready is having solid operations and a good team and an ability to hire and an ability to retain those people and um, good financial acumen and management of the business. Um, and then also good marketing and sales and branding. Like these more foundational pieces are what makes someone want to invest in your business in the first place from our perspective. And so we, the accelerator focuses on that. Um, and then what, and we do that in a cohort based way, as well as through a lot of one-on-one -on -one avenues, um, professional business coaching, uh, a mentor team we recruit for each business, et cetera. Um, and then we, we also provide direct grants and, and connect people through the accelerator to capital or, or pr prospective capital investors, that is. Um, and that's because we believe that like, sometimes we can over mentor and under invest in, in entrepreneurs, particularly black and Latinx entrepreneurs. And so with the accelerator, we don't want it to be just all advice. We want there to be connection to capital. Likewise with the investment fund, we don't think capital is a silver bullet. And so we're not just writing a check and saying like, good luck out there where it's a, it's the like inverse of the accelerator. It's more capital, a lot more capital and a lot less of a time investment in terms of the knowledge and connections, et cetera. But we, we talk about it as capital plus, um, but like it's financial capital, but it's also social capital, intellectual capital. So we're paying for professional business coaching for the entrepreneurs we invest in the same high quality, very effective coaching we've seen through our accelerator. Um, and then we're also ex like using the network we've built through our accelerator to extend connections um, for the portfolio companies we invest in. Because like one of the things venture capital does really well is help the companies they invest in hire, they do business development, they open up and connect them to new customers that help them really scale. You know, it's better than investment, like revenue, having big customers and like actually being profitable. Um, and so we're aiming to do the same thing, connecting with major hospitals, universities, grocery chains, others here um, who can provide like much bigger supply chains, much bigger purchase orders for the companies we work with so that we can help them find pathways to scale. So it's not all just about advice. Like sometimes people have what it takes. They just need the opportunity. So it's like a mix of opening up that opportunity as well as providing the professional business services and coaching. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Such a great example too. And I think it's an important thing for everyone, um, everyone out there who's considering starting a community investment fund to think about is that need for the technical assistance um, to, to support those business owners that you're investing in. Um, you know, it's, it's taken a page from, you know, from the angel investing world of becoming a value added investor, just as you were describing there, Yoni, of being able to make connections or helping with, um, you know, networking and that kind of thing. Um, 
but not to let that scare away anyone who is considering a community investment fund. There are organizations already out there and possibly out there in your community with whom you could partner potentially. Um, a lot of CDFIs, charitable loan funds, um, uh, organizations that might already be in existence within your community might already have that technical assistance available and there are ways to perhaps partner with them um, to, to be able to, um, to offer this to your uh, community. Yes, the, I see Yoni, you put in there the SBDC. What a great organization that is um, to help provide that, that opportunity uh, for technical assistance. So um, this has been awesome. I just wanna, I wanna give you a chance, Yoni. Is there, is there any other piece of advice you would give to someone who's maybe sitting in your shoes where you were two years ago? Um, any advice to them uh, for moving forward? Yeah, I, I think we're kind of at like the dawn of a golden age um, for for community investment. Um, I was in conversations about this 10 years ago and there were like far fewer national examples of this stuff. And now it feels like there's new funds popping up everywhere. There's groups across the country. There's a real community around it. And so um, my advice is to, to not do this in a silo or a vacuum. Like I struggle with this too. It's easy to just focus in your community and the, on the work you're trying to do and in the weeds of it. Um, but we've been able to go so much further because um, we've reached out to folks across the country, learned from them, looked at what they're doing. Um, like we didn't invent this all from scratch. We looked at um, NDVC, Ujima Fund, all sorts of others connected with you, connecting with the MDF and cutting edge capital. And so um, no one can do this alone. Like it's community investment, but it's also a community that's gonna get you to successful community investment. Um, and so I, I put a plug out for Zebras Unite um, and, and the ICC, um, which I can put links in the chat too. But yeah, broadly, just um, connect with your peers, even if they're not in your community. Building the community of community investment funds. Well said. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much, Yoni. This has been so helpful to illustrate um, what a, a success story you have created there. And I'm, I'm excited to continue watching your progress and, and doing my Navigating the Money Map course with you whenever you need. Um, Always my favorite. Great to talk <laughs> with you. Thanks so much for, for hosting this and, and uh, inviting us to the table and, and for your work nationally. I think like it only makes this much, it makes it so much easier to, to figure out because one of the hardest parts is like figuring out how to do this, like charting an uncharted path. So thanks so much. You betcha. Exactly. And that's, that is what kind of the mission of NC3 is all about is to let everyone know you are not alone and we are here to, uh, here to help. So that's a big part of what um, we're here to talk about today. And so I'm going to jump now into um, some of that help that's available to you. Uh, I'm going to start with these resources that I mentioned earlier. These are brand spanking new. They just went live on the NC3 website, I think yesterday. Um, so very exciting to have these up here. Um, there are a number of different tools. Here are the, the different tools. Each of these correspond with sections within the Community Investment Fund Handbook. Um, and they're meant to be able to, you know, the handbook is, is hopefully useful to lots of folks. It has lots of useful information in it, but these are actual tools that you can use with your team as you are working through the process to develop a, a community investment fund or a CIF for <laughs> that, the acronym. So that'll help me go a little faster. Um, each tool comes with uh, an introductory video that we're not gonna watch right now. They're all me, so now you've seen me, so you'll see me in a, a lot of these, uh, these introductory videos just to give you an idea of what the tool is about um, and how to work through it. Each, team, each um, tool also has uh, an instruction uh, sheet built into it. And I think, can I show, let's see. Um, we're gonna go to, uh, if I can figure out how to get there. Yeah, all right, I'm gonna have to stop share for a minute and go to one of the tools. Okay, here we go. Um, 
The first tool that I want to um, highlight is, if I can do this, no, come on. It's not letting me share, Mika. There, you got it? Can you, can you all see that? Probably not. Um, we can't, but I can also share if you're not able to. Yeah, I don't, it's, um... oh, here we go, here we go, I got it. Great. Sorry about that. Um, the first tool that we have here is the team builder matrix. And it's listed first for a reason and it's gonna be featured here today for a reason. And that is because the, the team that you bring together uh, to make this happen is the most important thing that you could, that, that you need to, to start with. So before you even go down the path of trying to figure out your investment thesis, your theory of change, or even how much you think you could raise, start with your team. And I, I've talked to folks who um, th their team is a team of one. Uh, you know, there are many people out there who have found the handbook and come to me and say, this is great. I want to do this within my community. Where do I begin? So again, that's part of what drove the development of this particular tool. The way it works is um, you can list the, the names of people already on your team or people that you have prospects, perhaps, that you would like to um, invite onto your team, and then a number of different ways to look at what they bring to the team, starting with some basic um, demographics, uh, the age, um, you know, their, um, their personal identifications, and where they come from within your community, just getting a, a good representation of, of different folks who are, are coming onto your team. Now, there's no right or wrong mix to these teams. It really depends on you and your community. So that's why there are some, some blanks left here that you could fill in yourself. If there are, if there are um, classifications that you particularly want to search for, you can add these in yourself. And what this does is it allows you to get kind of the, the lay of the land of the, the folks that you already have on your team and who you might need to invite onto the team. Once you get past the basic demographics, then we get into more of what do they actually bring to the team in terms of uh, the, the organizations they're affiliated with within your community. Um, you, you, know, you might want someone from the, from the financial community, as, as Yoni said, um, having somebody with that financial acumen will be really helpful to you. So having someone who speaks the language, so to speak, can be um, really important. Um, also having folks from, um, from an anchor institution, such as a community foundation, a hospital, maybe the university, you know, these are, these tend to be nonprofit organizations that are anchored in the community, have been around for a long time and have a very strong vested interest in the overall health and well-being of the community and its members. Um, having representatives from these folks, even though they, they might not have the financial acumen, they really have that community um, perspective that's so important. State and local government represent, um, representation is helpful. Economic development folks, they're gonna be the ones that are tapped into the, the business um, and the entrepreneurial ecosystem. And then, um, you know, of course, it'd be great if you could have some local business owners who have received investment and can bring that perspective. You also want to look at other um, other things that your team members bring to the table. Um, this just lists out a bunch of different um, attributes that they have. I'm, I'm not going to go through every single one of them. Um, their networks, who are they, who do they represent or who are they connected to? And then this is what I really want to get into is their qualities. Um, I've listed a few here in red because these are the must haves in order to have an effective team. Having those folks who are both have the organizational capacity and the management capacity to kind of get things done. And you also need, um, you need the leaders, but you also need the doers, the people who are going to take the strategy and start to implement it. So, Getting folks who are um, 
who are not only skilled in these areas, but willing to, to contribute these uh, skills to the team are really important. So this is just an example of, of um, one of the tools that is offered here. And um, I believe we I, I'll just give a brief overview of the, the other tools. And then I think we have a, um, an exercise, a group exercise for everyone. Um, but this, as I mentioned, the team builder matrix really is the first place to start, whether you have an existing team to kind of check and see if you've got everything you need or if you're starting to build your team. Next, we move into the investment thesis. And this is where you start to think through what is it that we're trying to do here? Are we going to be a real estate fund that, uh, that focuses on affordable housing? Are we going to be a fund like the Elevate Elevar fund that focuses on black and Latinx entrepreneurs and creating economic opportunity there? It, are we going to support local farmers? Um, so really thinking through what your community needs and what you are able to provide. Now, some communities have, um, have the resources to be able to do this in a, in a very um, formal and deep way. The Boston, uh, the Ujima project in Boston is a great example of this. They actually, um, I don't think they commissioned studies themselves, but there were studies being done in Boston that informed the need that they then created the fund to, to meet. So again, tapping into um, resources in your community to get a better idea of, of what is needed will help you to craft your investment thesis. And the worksheet is there to help you work through the stages to create that investment thesis. Um, the ones that everyone I think always wants to jump to and they, they are um, the ones that are going to be hopefully very helpful to you are um, the financial uh, financial tools. There's one to help you kind of model out how big of a fund can you realistically expect to raise and, and even down to the level of how much investment, how many investors do we need at different levels to be able to reach our goals? So it's, that's meant to be an iterative tool to help you understand if you're trying to raise a $5 million fund, how many different investments will it take at different levels to be able to reach that? Um, and then also the financial models to be able to set up um, both how you're going to manage the money coming into the fund, but then more importantly, how you're oh. going to uh, model that. How the fuck did I get account. over here? Um, so those are the, the, um, the basic tools. They're all available for download from the NC3 website. And I believe we have, um, uh, we have the links to that, Mika will put them up. But now we're going to, because I think we're, getting close on time. We're going to um, go into a breakout room real quick. And Mika's going to just randomly assign you all to different groups. Uh, the questions that uh, your group should be talking about are, are you in the process of starting a community investment fund? If so, where are you in the process? What are the biggest barriers or fears? And in looking at the team builder matrix, which we'll put the, uh, the link in the chat, um, what are, what or who are the biggest strengths and what are the biggest challenges? Um, so we'll let you take those and go into your breakout groups and we'll see you in a few minutes. Yep, yeah, I'm opening them all now. I want to right back. Oh. All right, great. Oh. Um, okay, so welcome back. Um, hopefully there were some fruitful discussions going on uh, in all of your breakout groups. And to that point, we're going to, we're going to ask you about that. We have a little poll that Mika will put up here um, just to get kind of a pulse check of where folks are, you know, are you starting to think about doing a community investment fund? You're already there. So Please click on this poll here and we'll, we'll see where everybody ends up. Okay, we're good, we got 
mostly 85% participation. Wow. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> all right. Um, and all right. If and I end this poll, hopefully you'll be able to see the results. Here we go. Share results. Can you see that? Um, yes, I've got a I've got a little thing up here. This is, so it looks like the vast majority of folks are just starting to think about this, or you're you're it's just you and you're ready to find a team. All right, so that's actually really exciting. Um, and I'm going to stop sharing on that. So that's okay. Um, yeah, so let's. All right, there we go. Um, so it sounds like a um, lot of interest in this and people getting ready to go. So I'd love to hear from some folks. Feel free to take yourselves off mute if you want um, and give us an idea of what's, you know, what's your, I think what was the biggest barrier or fear to getting started? Because that way we'll know how we can help you. I'm going to say something. Um, for us, it has been focus. Okay. We know what we do. We are a TA organization that does incubation and acceleration of worker ownership and other forms of cooperative enterprise. Right. That's what we do. We are in Detroit, a city with really cheap real estate for the moment, and a lot of potential displacement, right? Yep. And so our issue has been, and is still, we are working on focus, right? We're working on, do we want to do this? How do we want to do this? Do we want to partner with somebody who's already doing it? Um, and how do we link it in with the project partners that we are incubating and accelerating? That's that a, Chris, I, Chris, I'd love to pull you in now if you are willing to talk, Chris being from Michigan. Yes, um, <laughs> Chris and, and I have met. <laughs> we have, for sure. Well, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a great question, uh, Terry. And, you know, I, I think uh, uh, we were talking while you guys were in the room, kind of offline and talking about the uniqueness and individuality of every community and every project. And I think that's really, um, that's really at the crux of, of whether this makes sense. Obviously, um, you know, setting up a community investment fund uh, is not easy work. It's not fast work. Uh, it's got complexities. So, in that case, I think um, it makes a lot of sense to look for partners who may already be operating in that space and who you may be able to piggyback on with. Uh, you know, sometimes that doesn't address the need of the organization, though. And in that case, you may have to charge off your own, or you may want to do it. You know, one of the interesting things that we've seen in this work is that we get people who want to do something that's really hard because it's really important and because they know uh, that we need to have examples of how it can be done. And so I think you need to take the temperature again of your team uh, and say, you know, what, what, what's the highest priority for us? Do we want to demonstrate that you can do this in a city like Detroit, you know, for the work that we're going to do, or do we really have a need that as quickly as we can, uh, to get a community investment fund together or to partner with somebody else who's doing it because we need resources now. I think that would, that would be my counsel and, and your circumstances. So. I think that's right on. Thanks. Yeah. And I, yeah. And I would, I would add to that to say, um, you know, does your organization have the capacity or desire to kind of be that anchor institution, maybe of a, of a collaborative effort of many, um, organizations within your community. Maybe you do, maybe you don't, you know, no judgment on any of that, of course, but just being able to recognize if you have the, the, the capacity and desire to be the anchor institution, then there are ways to start building um, some, some center yeah, of gravity. Um, actually, we do. Cool. Um, and um, and the, the really interesting thing that, one of the many interesting things that you have brought to me in this webinar is the possibility of um, partnering with or outsourcing 
um, the, the fund management because I don't want to do it. <laughs> oh, yeah. right? I don't want to do it. I want to influence it. And we want to be, we want to be putting together the, the community groups that will be our loan committee and that will be making our community decisions. And we want to be active in soliciting the contributions because it is our branding, right? And our project partners and others like them who will be the beneficiaries of this lending. Yes? Yes. So we're in a very similar situation to um, to the loan fund that was created in St. Louis, right? We are very similar and, and you've encouraged us. So great. That's, that's great to hear. And, and I would say you are not alone in that, um, that concern about the fund management piece. I, I, I have found in the, the number of discussions I've had with different communities and even some work that I've done consulting with, um, I consulted with a group here in Vermont um, before I even worked uh, with WePower and, and Yoni's group um, who had a fantastic team pulled together, um, very well diverse, uh, you know, uh, lots of great representation from all the different facets of the community, lots of excitement and um, buy-in to creating this fund. And the thing that kept it from ever to, from getting implemented, and it still hasn't been implemented today, is running into this brick wall of fund management and realizing, wow, there's a lot involved with that. We don't have the expertise for that. We don't want to develop the expertise. And it was through that experience um, with, with this group in Vermont that I went out and found Mission Driven Finance. And I'm always on the lookout. There are, there are others like them around there. And so these are the kinds of resources that NC3 are trying to pull together and create um, you know, a, a matchmaking service almost to just let folks like you know that they're out there. Don't let that be a barrier. We'll find ways around it. Uh, that's that was the most encouraging thing <laughs> aside from the the tool that looks you know i can look at our team and see that we have what it takes right yeah. but the ability to outsource tasks that we do not want to add capacity for exactly exactly very 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 encouraging <laughs> awesome and I, I can I can chime in just a tiny bit more and say that sort of in the ecosystem out there around this world, one of the interesting things we're seeing happen is regional and statewide players that are saying, you know, let's set up systems that local communities, individual uh, funds can access. So, so that same piece, you know, the due, the due diligence piece or the professional management piece that's going to be required. Uh, so, so that's kind of exciting space too, as we see others looking at what can we do that will impact, you know, a broader region and that more individual funds could access in order for that kind of support. So there's some, some formal organizations that are really looking at that space as well. So, yeah. Super. Awesome. I want to uh, open it up to anyone else um, who is willing, willing to share what their biggest challenge or fear is about taking the first step towards a community investment fund. Um, I'll just say that I wanted to just echo that the resources have been really helpful. Um, I'm working with a group of folks on, is it, we're actually, I don't know, we're doing something a little bit different, but we're taking the, the tools of the community investment fund to create um, a way in for folks to invest in the Broadway space. Um, because it's a multi-million dollar industry and the folks, the way it work has always been a little wild, wild west. And a lot of the, um, most of the investors are accredited, but those are the decision makers of our culture and um, what gets disseminated and what makes it around the US and globally. And so we're very interested in rethinking that. And so we've actually, we're actually fairly close to launching a fund where we'll be able to reach many folks to hopefully invest. And then um, we are connected to producers who are ready to accept investments. So we're this, the, the resources of how to actually handle the fund is really helpful as well. Because at the end of the day, I'm a producer and I, I, can, I could do that work, but I also want to do my other work. So, so um, it's, it's also encouraging to hear the, res the resources that are provided to um, 
the folks in their accelerator because we actually want to do the opposite. We want to educate our investors um, in how they can continue to be become savvy investors and how they can participate in our space and bring more people in, um, particularly prioritizing uh, underrepresented folks uh, at the moment. Very, very cool. Um, another tool for you to be aware of then on that front. Oh my gosh, I have like so many things to say for you. Um, first of all, um, there is a website um, that um, now is under the uh, NC3's uh, management called the Local Investing Resource Center. And I, um, Mika can probably put the URL up there. It is all about how helping potential investors think through what they need to do to become a local investor. Um, we added a section about a year ago for wealth management advisors, which I'm really excited about because often what we see for people who are wanting to make investments um, and then they go and talk to their wealth management advisor who says, that's the stupidest idea I ever heard, usually because they just don't understand it. Um, and so we have a whole section here to help educate wealth management advisors so that they can stop being the gate gate keepers and hopefully open up more opportunities there. So definitely look into that. Um, but I just, Cynthia, that's such a great example of not only community investment, but bringing the community governance piece into what you're doing. And a little known factoid that um, the term angel for angel investors actually has its origin in Broadway. And that's what um, the, usually they were, you know, very, very wealthy people who were, who stepped in to save a Broadway production. They were called the Broadway angels. And that term has now become um, used more broadly for any kind of investment. So there you go. It's so great to know. And thank you. Yes, we're trying to figure out um, the transparency part and how do we get our investors uh, to be able to participate in the decision-making process. We've been having conversations about consensus building and what that could look like on a massive scale. And I'm sure through trial and error, we are going to learn a lot as we build this in real time. So cool. Well, we'll be keeping our eyes on you as, as another example that maybe we'll be featuring you someday on a call like this. <laughs> yeah. Um, Lavette uh, has hand raised. So please. Hi, how are you? Uh, we're in Boston. Uh, to be specific on um, one of the, um, I think we have 35 uh, neighborhoods. Roxbury is uh, predominantly black and brown folks. And I've been doing a lot of community activism and work here and uh, looking to start a um, community land trust. But also too, I think my fear is to actually get people's mindsets changed in terms of um, investing in, in themselves. And um, I know that that's probably like a really, um, I'm going to say basic stage here that, but it, it is not anything logistical, but it's just like a mind change shift is what I'm um, really con I'm challenged with. But also too, um, we have CDCs that are not meeting their mission. So how do we navigate that space too and not feel like we're competing with them but also too, they 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 should they're like a dinosaur, and then also too, they've gotten much bigger than than they should be, and that's why now they're more like a corporation than uh, you know some uh, uh, an organization that's supposed to be helping people. So that's wow. my sense. Yeah. Wow. So many so many things to dig into there, Lovett. So th yeah, thank you for that. Um, I'm going to uh, I, I want to address the question about you know helping get help helping people get to the point where they are more comfortable investing in themselves i think this is a very um a very big issue um and you know it's one that i'll admit i don't have the full answer yet it's one that i find really curious and interesting and i'm, I'm trying to get to the bottom of it you know i think there is some um there's level of distrust in the in the financial system the financial system um, is, is so opaque and, uh, and needlessly complicated um, in many ways. And so it can be scary for people to think about, um, uh, about investment, uh, even if they know it's through a community organization and going to somebody who they can actually see and invest in, there's still that distrust in the system. So that's something that we're really going to need to be working on um, to, to help um, dispel some of that. Part of it, I think, is through creating more opportunities for 
uh, for education um, with funds, as, as Cynthia was saying before, that you know there's still a huge need for this investor education. Um, and what does it actually? What does it just mean? What does it look like? How does it? How does it work? Um, and how do I do it effectively and not feel like I'm, you know, being taken to the cleaner or going to lose all my money? Um, so that's that's something that um, that. That I, that's a big part of what I'm working on through the nonprofit that I started, the Initiative for Local Capital, um, does a lot of that kind of work. And I'd be happy to talk with you more about that um, outside of this webinar, Lovett. Um, some other cases, you know, you mentioned CDCs um, and other things, especially when they start to get really big um, and, and, and you might feel competitive with them. Um, I think there's, um, this is part of the bridge building that needs to happen within a community is to understand how there, um, how there's a need for all these different types of capital. You know, when I mentioned the, the group that I worked with here in Vermont, um, as I was starting to work with them and talking with other uh, financial capital providers in the state, um, you know, and talking about the plans to create this community investment fund, and a lot of folks, uh, you know, said back to me, it's like, well, you know, why do we need another loan fund? And I said, well, precisely, we don't need another loan fund. We need another way to get different types of capital um, out to businesses because not every business is, is um, in a place where they can afford to bring on a loan or take in capital as a loan. They might need to take it in through a revenue share agreement or other forms, which is, um, again, a lot of what informed the work that I then did with WePower. Um, and so there are, there are different capital needs that um, funds structured in different ways can fill capital gaps. And presented that way, um, you can start to make bridges to, those, to CDCs and other funders to let them see how you are a partner um, a potential partner in a capital stack and not a replacement for what they do. Um, so hopefully that that helps. Um, any other any other comments before we move on to kind of the next section or questions? We will have time for at the end for Q and A. Okay, I think I'm going to turn it over here to Chris talk a little bit more about NC3's role in all of this. Thank you, Janice. It's always so hard to follow Janice. I wish that sometimes we didn't have to do workshops or seminars together. So, but anyway, um, on the other hand, there's great joy in it as well. So I, I do wanna talk a little bit about NC3 and how if you or an organization you're part of is interested in doing and pushing forward on, on uh, a CIF in your community, um, there are some things that we're working on that we want you to be aware of. Uh, one of those is just uh, technical assistance. So one of the things that NC3, because of our, the national organization that we are and the relationships we have across the country, we can help you find people like Janice um, who can come into your community and work one-on-one. -on -one. And so that's, uh, that's one piece of it. Uh, another mechanism that we've used on several occasions across the country is coming into your community with our own team and meeting with a local team. And typically we uh, work over a period of months on that, helping you to identify if you don't already have a team put together, uh, how we can help you put together a team and who do you want in that room. And then we'll spend a couple of days there in the community with you and your team uh, and uh, walk away with kind of a plan of how to move forward and then be able to surprise, supply support to that uh, going forward as you move forward on your project. The third thing, which is, um, is part of the visionary work that Janice has been doing uh, for the past uh, a couple of years at least, uh, is a task force that we created at NC3 um, where we brought in some colleagues from outside the organization, experts in especially the regulatory world. Uh, and uh, we put together a proposal that we have now sent to the SEC uh, to create a new type of community investment fund. One of the reasons this work is so challenging is that the legislation that empowered the community investment funds that currently exist is from 1940. Uh, and it is 
uh, challenging and, and maybe even some of it was outdated when it was created because much of what the, much of the structures that they proposed in that act have never been utilized because the regulatory burden is so tough. And, and for me, I always talk about scaling down um, because for many of these, you, all, you have to have a larger community in order to do them. So we currently have a proposal in front of uh, the, the investment managed division and division at the Securities and Exchange Commission to create what we have called a 21st century community investment fund. Uh, and when we get these done, because we never say if we get these done anymore, when we get these done, um, it will be a lot easier to set up these funds. They won't be sector restricted like they are now. They'll be much more approachable for non-accredited investors. Uh, they will be uh, the oversight will be on a state level, not a federal level, uh, and we really see them as scalable down to smaller communities. Uh, so Mika, who's always three or four steps ahead of Janice and I, uh, has put a petition uh, link in the chat right now. One of the things that, we, that was kind of curious that the SEC asked us to do was to demonstrate market demand for these 21st century community investment funds. So we kind of fleshed out what they looked like um, in our proposal and then approached uh, partners from across the country and asked them to sign a petition that said, you know, if these type of community investment funds were in place and legal, we would use it here. Uh, so if you haven't already signed that, we would encourage you to jump on that link and sign that. and then one step further for organizations who are already operating a fund or are working on operating a fund, your own fund, and you think, wow, we would love to pilot one of these because this is part of our proposal that they let us pilot uh, this 21st century community investment fund. Uh, there'll be a separate link there that you can fill out and then we will have you listed as one of our potential pilot organizations or communities. So when they give us permission to do it, um, then we'll have a place to go and, and hopefully we'll be able to set some pilot uh, community investment funds up across the country. So um, so please take a look at, again, the petition uh, and then if, if being a pilot organization or community looks attractive to you, uh, please fill out that form as well that describes uh, how you could pilot a 21st century community investment fund. Next, uh, I just wanted to say a couple of things about NC3. Uh, so we are a, we are a coalition, uh, and when we set ourselves up as a coalition, we did that very deliberately. Uh, we can't be very excited about community investment, uh, where the wisdom of the community comes to an investment or a project, and not say the same thing about the the, the work that we do. And so we want to make sure that um, we learn from all of our partners from across the country. Uh, and so I'm encouraging you to join NC3 if you're not part of it. Um, and uh, if you're part of it, uh, then we'd love you to give us a call, um, reach out to me or to Mika or to Janice or, or to any of, the, any of our other board members uh, that you may know and give us some feedback, uh, tell us how you can help, what, what, how you can support us, what you need from us. Uh, Janice referenced the LIRC. Uh, we're, we're gonna use our partners to help vet and improve the information that's on that document or on that website and continue to improve that. We really want it to be a very useful uh, resource for people across the country and you can help us do that and could help us potentially add to that so all right uh, so uh, there's a couple of things that you can do uh, calls to action uh, near the end of our meeting I'm going to turn it back over to Janice for any uh, kind of closing questions or comments that you might have uh, her, her labor right now and her brain is free to you I encourage you to take advantage of it uh, because it's worth a lot so thank you very much. Again, we really appreciate you being here. All yours, Janice. All right. Well, it's only free for the next 10 minutes. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I want to um, um, I want to put somebody on the spot here, maybe um, Lady Lawrence Carty, who has been putting a really interesting conundrum in the chat here that I think a lot of folks would benefit from from hearing about because I think it's not just happening in Boston, it's happening elsewhere. Um, would you be would you be willing to to just give a little bit of background? Oh, uh, no worries, absolutely. Okay, so I'm in Rock Ferry, and uh, to make a long story short, there is a church which is a church building is over 100 years old, and it's a part of the history of the local community. And 
outside developers are using the CDC to, um, to fund or to partner with to, um, you know, sort of people from DC were trying to do this, the kind of displacement development where they tear down the church and build condos that normally one would attribute to private investors and developers. But the, the gist of it is that the kind of funding that we need is not just funding in terms of uh, rehabilitating the building, but also just funding to stay the course to, to, to keep our church. And so that's, so it's a sort of a chicken and egg problem. If uh, you can't go the distance in superior court, they can just depose, et cetera, and just run out the clock. And even if the developers know that, that the community could win on the merits, we would just lose by default. Wow. So the, there's a very real need for, for legal fees to be able to kind of play on their, their turf. Their field. And I'm yeah. sure this is happening in other cities besides Boston. You know, for instance, you know, a large project, uh, maybe rules and variances are inappropriate, et cetera. But without a community funding to, to sort of, as you said, just play on their field in terms of uh, the legal field. I mean, another, at Saturday, we were protesting, there's a local brewery, which is suing to stop affordable housing for seniors. So that's, uh, as the local community supports it, the variances are all there. Um, but you know you need to have the, the money to go to court and fight those lawsuits. Otherwise, you're dead in the water. Wow. Yeah. Um, That's happening right next door in Jamaica Plain, by the way. But yeah, which is the 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 epicenter of the Boston Impact Initiative. Um, and I wonder, I wonder if have you do you know Deborah Freeze? Um, the found, she's the founder of um, the Boston Impact Initiative. I believe, um, I believe I've seen her uh, name in, in some space. I'm a member of Ujima, and I think okay. I, I might have come across her name through that space. Yeah, this. I, I, I didn't know that they would fund uh, legal fees. Also, I don't know if they will. Oh, I'm not saying it's yeah. I'm sorry, but if they if they don't. It's like, they might know who would. Um, if you want to, um, Mika, can you make a connection somehow? I can. I would be happy to make um, just an email connection to Deborah. Um, we greatly appreciate that. Just, just to get. I mean, because she's right there, um, and she, I'm sure she. If she's not aware of this, she's probably bumped up against something similar, um, and we'll know specifically. Like we'll know right there in your neck of the woods. Yeah, Deborah's also got great connections to the legal community there as well. And for her work at Boston Impact Initiative and Ujima received a ton of pro bono support. So my guess is you're right, Janice, that would be a great connection. So yeah. Mika, we... what's, the, what's the best way to make that connection? Um, I'm messaging right now to collect email addresses and I can help facilitate that afterwards. Awesome. That would be Thank great you. because I mean, We've got pro bono architectural support. Um, you know, they came in with this, um, you know, you know, we got a, a real structural engineer and that sort of thing, but we've just run out of steam when it came to the legal. So it, even if it doesn't help us getting this in place can help, you know, you know, marshal resources and because there will be more besides us. Yeah, it, it's unfortunately it's a ubiquitous problem with you know with this type of, of extractive capital where you know a developer comes in and sees um, some prime real estate just as Terry was talking about in Detroit um, start salivating and jump in on it before the community has the opportunity to organize and respond because it takes time and it takes money so yeah I think this is um, this is something that we can definitely try to look into and see. Hopefully, hopefully we can help you, but if not, well, thank you. I mean, w one quick comment is that, as we say, skin folks don't mean kin folk. <laughs> right on, right on. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you. Thank you for letting me put you on the spot um, and for sharing that that um, example that I'm that hopefully will. Uh, We'll, we'll see if we can do something about that. Um, Want to open it up just in our last few minutes here if there's any other questions. Um, 
that we can help with. Maybe, uh, maybe we have done our job and your brains are full of ideas and excitement and, uh, and enthusiasm for moving forward. Hopefully that is the case, but uh, I definitely see lots of smiling faces um, out there. And um, as we said, the, there, these resources are here. Um, please uh, download them and use them. And if you have questions, um, find your way through NC3 and we'll, this is, this is what we're all about. So, and keep up the good work folks. It's exciting to see so many people here interested in this topic.